Okay. So our second installment in our exploration of the highest and subtlest non-dual teachings available to us from the history of South Asian spirituality. So some 5,000 years of inquiry into the deepest and most essential nature of what it means to be human. Okay, so today I want to do something quite exciting, quite thrilling, but also quite scary. I'll review a little bit um, what we talked about last week and reintroduce those three dangers or those three warnings that we talked about last week. I mean, two of the warnings that I will tell you about today are from last week and I'll add a new one. So this is the, I guess you could say, third warning. Um, and so I was thinking of calling this uh, dangers, warnings, and disclaimers. You know? <laughs> and I was like, okay, maybe that's too doomsday-ish. So maybe we should call it prerequisites for a profitable study of Advaita Vedanta, profitable study of non-duality. Oh, either one of those titles will work. So really, as you know, those of you who've been studying this stuff for a while, you'll know that the main bulk of today's talk is going to be about the sadhana chatushtaya, the ne necessary prerequisites or requirements needed for Vedanta to work. You know, and what does it mean for Vedanta to work? For us to, at the end of all of this, be meaningfully made happier. For, and, and it's no small promise, like for Vedanta to work, we must be permanently free from all forms of suffering. Not that grief won't come, not that pain won't come, not that you know misfortune won't visit us, but we remain ever beyond all of those trials and tribulations. We are permanently abiding in a state of no suffering, of no resistance. Okay, that, that's one half of the promise. The other half is Paramananda Prapti. You should be able to, as a result of all of this, be completely fulfilled in the most lasting and meaningful way possible. You've attained Paramananda, the supreme bliss. So nothing short of that. So today, I'll talk about why a study of Vedanta might not give you those things. You know, because if you don't have the requirements necessary for a study of Vedanta, at the very best, you would have learned a very clever and sophisticated philosophy. But you won't, by any means, be permanently free from suffering and permanently established in lasting joy, fulfillment, and peace. Okay, so that's going to be the bulk of today's talk. And then at the very end of the talk, I'd like to introduce nine arguments um, as to why you are not the body. So we're picking up the thread from last week. We were studying the Ashtavakra Gita, which I introduced last week and, and explained was the most pure of all the scriptures, according to Neem Karoli Baba. We talked about why that was the case. Um, and in exploring verse 4 of chapter 15, which we started with last week, there's a, there's a reason for starting there. Um, hopefully that reason will become clearer as we continue. But for now, I'm going to pick up where we left off last week, verse four of chapter 15 and explain that very first fragment of the verse. Natvam deho, nate deho. You are not the body, the body is not yours. And in order to prove this, the first part, you are not the body, will appeal to nine arguments. Now I'm not really going to explain all nine arguments. I'm just going to sketch them out for you. Just lay them out before you. And next week we'll take them up in earnest and really kind of explore each one. Today though, I just want to sketch them. So you can chew on them over the week and you can kind of just have them. Now the first argument is from my guru. The second one is from my guru's guru's guru. The next five, or actually the next six, are from Shankara's Aparokshana Bhuti. And the last one is from the Mandukya Upanishad. So a compilation of nine um, arguments compiled over a series of Upanishads, a series of Prakaranas, and a series of direct transmissions. Um, and we'll just like place it before you today. And at the very end of this class, God willing, um, we'll offer what I think is, a, in my opinion, a foolproof surefire test that you can use right now to verify your understanding. Like if you, if you think that you've understood this verse, you are not the body, the body is not yours. Here's a way to quickly invalidate that if that's not true. <laughs> we'll give that in the end, the, the test, okay? The test of knowledge. So that's where we're headed. That's the structure for today. Let's just start at the beginning. So as you know, we're studying non-duality. And there must be some disclaimers before we take up this very subtle and very radical philosophy. This is, as you know, the very highest, the, the final revelation. And in fact, Thomas Byram, whose translation we're working with next to Swami Nitya Swarupananda, by the way, I didn't introduce it last week, but I should have. And the book that we're primarily working with for this class is going to be Swami Nitya Swarupananda's Ashtavakra Sangita. It's got the Sanskrit and it's got English translation and a little bit of commentary. So I like this one a lot. This is our, I guess, working textbook. Um, but we're also going to be appealing to Thomas Byron's very poetic English translation called The Heart of Awareness, I think. 
So my copy is like over there. I'm not going to go get it, but I think I showed it to you last week. We're also going to be working with Aparokshana Bhuti and the edition that I'm using right now is Swami Chinmayanda's commentary. I'm not really using it for the commentary. I just like that um, the Sanskrit is there and also there's like in each verse, a gloss for each of the Sanskrit words. It helps me build my vocabularies. That's why I like these little types. So, so I like this one, Aparokshana Bhuti by um, uh, Shankara commented upon by Swami Chinmayanda. So that's the two books that will kind of be appealing to for most of our study together. I mean, there's a reason for this. The, they are both what you might call prakaranas. You know, prakaranas mean introductory texts that help you understand the core teachings of Advaita Vedanta. You'll recall from last week that there are three main texts for Advaita Vedanta, the triple canon or the foundational text of Advaita Vedanta. They are, as you'll recall, first and foremost, the Upanishads. This is our main canon, the main... Uh, thrust, the central theme of Vedanta is found in the Upanishads. And therefore, we can even say the Vedanta, by definition, is the teaching of the Upanishads. Vedanta nama Upanishad pramanam. The wisdom of the Upanishads is literally Vedanta. So this is exciting, you know, because the Upanishads, as you know, represent the world's most ancient extant spiritual tradition. So this is like spiritual revelation from the very dawn of human civilization like the freshest, purest um, of our scriptures, you know, undiluted by all the subsequent um, events that happen in human history. This is perhaps the beating heart of human civilization. Now, even that word Vedanta, Anta means end. So Vedas, the set of ritualistic and lit uh, litanical texts from I guess you could say 2000 BCE or some scholars date it as far back as 4000 BC, however you want to date it, the Vedas, um, at the very end of the Vedas, many of these Upanishads appear. In the middle of the Vedas, you also get some Upanishads. So Vedanta doesn't literally mean the end of the Vedas. It means like the point of the Vedas or the summary of the Vedas. But a great philosopher, very eminent philosopher, Professor Arindam Chakravarti, actually explained it in one lecture. Anta Veda means the very cutting edge of knowledge. Veda means knowledge from the root vid or vidya. Uh, Veda means knowledge. Anta means end. So Vedas, Vedanta then means the cutting edge of knowledge the very limit uh, of what words can express, the very highest, the very edge of human conception. So I think that's an exciting definition. So recall, the first thing is the Upanishad. That's the main, main text, series of texts that we work with. Some 10 or 11 are particularly important to us. That's because Shankara gave great commentaries on those 11. And so they become like the core Upanishad canon, right? So there are hundreds of Upanishads, 108 Ramachandra says, but we're only really interested in 11. And all 11 of them say the same thing as the others. So if you've read one Upanishad, you've basically read them all. And everything that the Upanishads have said can be summed up in a very simple aphorism. You know, and it goes like this. Uh, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya Jiva Brahmeva Naparaha. Brahman alone is real. The world is an illusion. And the individual is none other than Brahman. That's it. The central insight of the Upanishads. Okay. Next to the Upanishads, as we described last week, we have the Bhagavad Gita. What you get in the Gita, you get in the Upanishads. The Gita resorts to Upanishadic language throughout the discourse um, of Krishna teaching Arjuna. So all of the Upanishadic lessons are distilled, if you were, if, if you will, and essentialized, as it were, in this text called the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, then the third thing, in order to resolve the various philosophical problems and logical issues of the Upanishads, in order to respond to objections and contrary viewpoints, we have the Brahma Sutra, Badranaya's. Uh, Rama Sutra, sorry, Brahma Sutra that Vyasa comments upon and that Shankara also comments upon. So last week I showed you the Swami Gambirananda-ji translation of Shankara's commentary on Vyasa's Brahma Sutra. And that text, as we described last week, is incredibly dense, incredibly difficult. But all three together, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Brahma Sutra constitute um, the core, core syllabus, our main textbooks for the study of Vedanta. Then as I explained last week, there's a second set of texts. They're called the Brihad Prastanatraya. And they are, as you recall, Advaita Siddhi, Tatsuki, um, Chitsuki, sorry, Chitsuki, um, Kandana, Kanda, Katya, like all these like really philosophical texts that are meant to deal with the logical problems. They're like almost an extension of the Brahma Sutra in some sense. And they're not anything we're going to be considering. We're not interested in those texts. They're actually not very well known and they're not very important for what we're interested in doing. What are we interested in doing? All of us have heard Vedanta extensively together. Um, we've listened to lectures. We understand. All of us understand 
what Vedanta is trying to say. We've heard it so much so that we're able to repeat it to people if we're asked. We can even write books, some of us, on it. You know, we understand what Vedanta is trying to say, but, and here's the problem, there's a disjunct between what we know to be true and how we live our lives. We're not living according to our understanding, which, you know, a traditional teacher of Advaita would say, well, then you haven't heard it. You haven't really heard it. You haven't finished Shravana yet. You said you did Shravana, you heard it, and then you said you finished Manana, you reflected upon it and thought about it and understood it, but here you are acting not in line with what you supposedly have heard and understood. So chances are you haven't really heard it then. You know, a, a, like we said last week, a traditional Advaita teacher would tell you that Advaita begins and ends in Shravana. You just have to hear it once. Once you hear it, you live according to it. End of story. Because the way this works is, as we said last week, and as we say time and time again, this, the, the, the approach is not to pretend like something is true. It's not to take anything on faith. It's not to believe anything. It's just to follow along with the argument, with the statement, and see that it is true right now. It's just to notice. It's a noticing exercise. And so if you hear it the right way, you'll immediately notice what the teaching is trying to say. You'll notice that it's true even now, always was true, always will be true, and thereby you go free. Okay, but if you haven't quite heard it, then... You know, then we have, we run into all these problems. So there is a set of texts, as I described last week, that specifically address the third part of this exercise. You start by listening and to listen, you go to the Upanishads, you go to the Bhagavad Gita, you go to the Brahma Sutra, you progress to intellectualizing, which you can do with the Brahma Sutra and Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita on their own. But you might also take the support of these other texts, very difficult, logical masterpieces like Advaita Siddhi. And after that, having thoroughly understood, then you enter into the meditation portion. You hear, you reflect, and you meditate. Meditation is really, in Vedanta, just sitting quietly and seeing that it's true, reflecting on what you heard and noticing it in real time. So you might sit there, close your eyes, and do an inquiry in real time, using the scriptures as a kind of support for your inquiry. And as you do this constantly, eventually you come to shift your paradigm and abide lastingly and permanently in the truth, in reality. You eschew all those fictions and imaginations that thus far you've premised your life on. So Nididhyasana is realization, it's integration, it's actualization. Traditionally, it's called meditation. Now, the text that we decided to study is the Ashtavakra Sangita, which is a Nididhyasana text. Some people call it a Prakarana, an introductory text. Oh, I should also explain. Uh, besides these three texts, right, there's also something called Prakaranas. Prakaranas are primers. Prakarana Grantas are texts that like introduce the system of Advaita. So even before you come to the Upanishads, there's like entry level requirements, right? And that is the Prakaranas. They give you a kind of preparation so that when you enter the Upanishads, you won't be like completely at a loss. And so a very classic Prakarana is Vedanta Sara, the essence of Vedanta. Um, there's Aparokshana Bhuti, which is my favorite. I think it's so subtle that it, to me, is not just a prakarana. It's like the highest philosophy, Shankara's Aprokshana Bhuti, which we're going to be working with. Um, and there are others like Drigdrishya Viveka. There's so many different prakaranas, Panchadeshi, like all these prakaranas. And some people consider the Ashtavakra itself a prakarana. But I think Ashtavakra and its companion text, Avaduta, um, Avaduta Gita, and also the Yoga Vasishta function as meditation texts. They don't tell you anything you haven't heard before, but they tell it to you in a way that's so direct so austere, so forceful that it demands uh, realization here and now. And if you're not prepared for it, you will either completely miss the point or uh, worse, you might be almost offended by it, uh, challenged by this text, affronted by what it has to say because it spares you no uh, compromise. It just goes right to the heart of it. Okay, so that's what we're studying. We're studying this text. Now, I mentioned last week that there were three risks in starting with these Nididhyasana texts, like Yoga Vasishta, even Mandukya Upanishad. These risks even apply to that, because Mandukya Upanishad is so radical that you could say these warnings, these disclaimers apply as readily to the Mandukya as they do to this Ashtavakra Sangita. And last week, you'll recall, the first warning was, um, this can sometimes cause a person to feel like uh, we don't need to do any spiritual practices anymore. You know, because the claim is, you are always free, you always will be free, you're free now. There's nothing that you can do to be free. And I heard one sadhu say it beautifully. What's the distance between the wave and the ocean? None whatsoever. The wave is the ocean. What's the difference be distance between the movie character and the screen? The movie character doesn't need to do anything to become the screen. It's already the screen. The screen is the reality of the movie character. What's the distance between the lectern and the wood or the chair and the wood out of which it is made? What's the distance between a gold ornament and the gold out of which it is made? None. 
when you realize that your essential nature is pure awareness, it always was, always will be, and even now is that, um, you might get the sense that there's nothing that you need to do. And true, in the Ashtravakra, you hear language just like that. As I said last week, you are bound only by your habit of meditation, right? You get kind of phrases like that, which might lead a beginner to very conveniently say, ah, in that case, I'll stop meditating. I mean, I'll stop praying. After all, this is all an illusion. It's a reflection. This world is a mere passing shadow. What gods exist that I can pray to anyway? I'm going to abandon my bhakti practices. No more puja, no more devotions, no more prayer. And finally, maybe other people don't exist. You know, why do I need to go out and selflessly serve? So I might abandon karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga. I might abandon selfless service. I might abandon devotion. I might abandon meditation. That would be a very wrong way to handle this text. As Nagarjuna says, it's like catching a snake from the wrong end. If you don't know how to properly handle this philosophy, you can do yourself a great deal of harm. And if you ever arrive at the conclusion that you don't need to meditate, you don't need to pray, you don't need to do bhakti, uh, karma, all that stuff, then that is at your own peril. You know, one sadhu was telling me, and by, we were having this discussion and one person got up and said, okay, okay, if all of this is true and I'm Brahman, whether I know it or not, whether I do anything about it or not, why should I just now like just live my life and not care about anything? Why, why should I continue to engage with spirituality if I'm already Brahman? And this sadhu, great sadhu and master of Advaita said to him, do that at your own risk. Try it. Actually try it and give up all your practices and, and get on with it. I mean, after all, you're Brahman, right? Okay. If you really think you have no more problems because you've realized that you're Brahman, try it. Take your knowledge for a test run. Do away with your meditation. See what happens. And chances are you'll find that the mind is no longer able to reflect that truth anymore and you lose touch with it. Even though you know it's true, the knowledge doesn't do you any good. You need the meditation, the prayer, and the selfless service to tune the body and mind to that truth so it manifests and reflects that truth at all times. And now in the course of this discussion that Sadhu had mentioned about uh, another story, another Sadhu that he was studying with, I think he heard from that Sadhu, that someone once came into the temple and said, why should I have the picture of Sri Ramakrishna on my altar? And this guy had been studying Advaita, right? So he knows that the reality of Sri Ramakrishna is the same as the reality of me. I am awareness, Ramakrishna is awareness. Tattva Masi, okay? So why don't I just put my own picture up? Like instead of worshiping Sri Ramakrishna, why don't I just put a picture of myself on the altar? And you know, this great monk, he said, try it. To this aspirant, he said, try it. See what happens. I mean, how beautiful. And of course it didn't work. You know, the picture did not produce the same level of spiritual elevation, didn't give them that sense of solace, didn't give them the deep meditation that they were looking for, that they had gotten with the other pictures of deities and all that. So, yeah, at the end of the day, if you think this means you don't have to meditate or pray or do any of the other stuff in spiritual life, do so at your own peril, try it, you'll soon see that that's not what is being meant here. So that's the first warning. If you come away thinking that you don't have to do any more practices, we're in trouble. Okay, and hopefully you can see what those practices are for. They're just there to express what is already true anyway. They're there, they're there to manifest and embody the truth. Okay. The next thing is, um, another risk is that this text has the tendency of creating atheists in that people come to religion and maybe many of them have faith and, and, and this idea of like, there's a higher power and all that. And then they hear statements like, you are God. You yourself are that very reality. This world is a reflection. It's a, it's an, a mirage. It's an appearance. There's no creator deity. There's no preserver deity. There's no world to create or preserve or destroy. And when you hear that stuff, you might think, ah, there is no God. Not quite. It's actually the opposite. There is no you. There is only God. As Swami Chid Brahmananda said funnily, people sometimes come to non-duality hoping to do away with God. But actually what non-duality does is it does away with you. It leaves God intact. <laughs> so Shankara very famously said that the wave belongs to the ocean never the ocean to the wave you see you can never say oh the ocean is held in the wave any more than you can say god is in me the individual no you the individual are an appearance in god and it just so happens that you at your essential nature and god at her essential nature are one and the same so you must be very careful here if you come away with like an atheistic doctrine then you've also misunderstood this text okay the, those are the two warnings i offered um last time so you've heard this already. It bears repeating. Now, the third warning. And then, by the way, about the second warning, um, I should say that if you truly understand this text, the way that you know is because uh, once you understand it, all religions are true to you. Everything that other religions express poetically and allegorically, you now understand directly. So you'll be like, of course, I understand what God is, formless spirit. That's just awareness. I know exactly what the burning bush meant when it said to Moses, hey, Asher, hey, I am that I am. Like you'll read the Quran and the Bible and be like, this is, this is perfectly lucid. All, every word in this is true. It gives you the way to understand religion. And actually that makes religion more meaningful, actually. 
And so you should be actually doubly excited about religious life and you'll see what the practices are for and, and you probably participate in them more uh, exuberantly. Okay. So that's the second warning. Now the third warning is new and it pertains to today's material directly. And the warning is this, you might study a lot of Vedanta and get to the end of all this only to find out, like I said earlier, it didn't work. You, know, I, you might feel like, I don't know, I just, I know all of this stuff, but it just doesn't matter so much that I know it. Okay, what's happened? The danger is if you start studying this text without the necessary prerequisites, then it won't work. Like you won't have the realization the text is helping you have. It might just go over your head or you might just understand it on a superficial intellectual level. That flash of insight though, which uh, Vidyaranya Swami says can happen to anyone, anytime for any reason, happens in a flash according to this great master Vidyaranya Swami. Um, it might not happen for you. You know, and, and you, you might get study for years, like 20 years of studying Vedanta and you might not have this flash of insight. And at the end of it all, you wonder why. Today's class is very important because it's going to address why. It's going to show you why it is that that flash of insight didn't happen, you know? Um, so what's the risk? I would say, okay, if we're going to be very Advaitic and traditional, we'll say the risk is you'll waste your time. The, the biggest risk is you could really devote a lot of your time and energy to studying this. But if you don't see that the foundations are solid, you're just going to fall later on anyway. So that's, I think, a huge risk, right? Like wasting your time, like studying a philosophy that isn't fruitful, that doesn't actually create lasting change in your life. However, I'd like to qualify this or contest this. I think it's still useful. I think even if you don't have the qualifications that we're going to discuss today, and all of you do to some extent, Right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be practicing the level at which you're practicing. You wouldn't attend lectures. You wouldn't read books. You wouldn't sacrifice all that you could otherwise be doing in order to be here. So you do have these requirements, I would argue. But even if you didn't, let's say you're like the least um, qualified aspirant of Vedanta that ever lived. Okay, You were just totally unfit for the study of Vedanta according to the criteria that we're soon going to expound. Even then, it's still valuable. Even then, it's valuable. Because even if you just understand it on a superficial intellectual level, I would argue you've come a long way because that very understanding will later flower into realization, will inspire you to actually go back and fix the foundations. You know, if you get excited, if you become thrilled by the possibilities and the prospects of this study of Vedanta, if it excites you even in a merely intellectual way, I think that's still good. It will cause you to come to it in a genuine and grounded way. And let's Posit an even worse case. Not only are you unqualified, let's say you didn't even understand it. Let's say it totally went over your head, okay? And none of this made sense. None of it checked out in your own reality. It all seemed like a bunch of semantics and wordplay. And you're like, whatever, I didn't get it. Even then, I think you haven't wasted your time. If after 20 years, none of this is understandable to you, I would argue you've still achieved something. And Swami, G Swami Vivekananda himself says this, truth is like a corrosive substance. Once it's applied, it will continue to work long after its application. So if you hear this, I really do think it goes somewhere deep into you because you, your being will resonate with it. These truths naturally speak to the highest and subtlest part of your experience. And naturally then the soul that you are will call out to these texts the same way these texts are calling out to the soul, even though you are none the wiser. So if you hear it and forget it, I don't think it's totally forgotten. I think somewhere in some subconscious realm, it's working, it's acting upon you and it's slowly reconfiguring things in, I guess, the back of your mind, it's slowly rearranging the furniture somewhere. And the next thing you know, you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I'm the self. Or more likely you wake up and you go, oh my God, I need to get these four, four fold qualifications, you know? So this is the risk. You might get to the end of all of this and find out that it doesn't work, but even then have no fear. Um, it's still productive. It's still valuable. It will work on you regardless of where you are on the path. And I say that only because the next thing that I'm going to say might sound a little exclusionary because I'm going to now reveal the very highest, right? The very, very um, important requirements that you need to start Vedanta even as um, in Apokshana Bhuti, what is it? Swami Chinmayanda says to even enter the court of Vedanta. To even begin the process, you need these fourfold qualifications. So what are they? Now, listen carefully, because if you're finding that Advaita doesn't work, chances are it's because you haven't developed these fourfold qualities to the extent to which you need to develop them for a profitable study of Vedanta. Okay, so really, I think this is probably the most important class. 
I don't know how long this series will go. It could be uh, maybe hundreds of lectures, you know, it could be 10 lectures, however long this series is, I think we'll all look back and say, this was the most important material in this series and in the tradition itself, because without this, nothing else can happen. So let's get right into it. Uh, very briefly, I'm going to sketch out for you what is called in this tradition, the Sadhana Chatushtaya, Sadhan Chatushtaya, um, the fourfold qualifications for a profitable study of Vedanta. I'm going to list them out to you the way it's traditionally listed. And then I'm going to show you how Shankara kind of plays with that sequence. And then thirdly, I'm going to offer you a monk secret, a Himalayan kind of monk hack for how to understand this list, okay? Or how to activate the list or how to use it in your own life. So we'll start with the very first one. Sadhana Chatushtaya. Uh, sadhana, sorry. Sadhana Chatushtaya. Sadhana Chatushtaya is the fourfold qualification starting with Viveka. It's the very first thing that you need to even begin a study of Vedanta. Viveka is discernment between that which is real. And I'm going to put really real versus that which seems real, but isn't. Often you'll see this translated as discrimination between the real and real. Let's, let's elucidate a bit. Let's offer a few more words. It's discernment between that which is really real versus that which seems real, but isn't. Okay, without this, you can't begin Vedanta. Why? Because likely without Viveka, you won't see any value to the study of Vedanta. You'll be like, no, I much rather pursue the things of the world. Like I much rather work on my investment portfolio. It's much more real to me to amass wealth. And I much rather work on improving my success in the world of dating. I mean, pleasure is more immediate and real to me. So I'm going to live a life oriented around wealth, oriented around pleasure. And it doesn't have to be like in this heinous way. It can be a very innocent kind of, I just want to like raise my kids and I want them to win soccer tournaments. And I myself want to just, you know, get a promotion and feel like my work mattered. You know, on every level of worldliness, from the grossest, most centralist to the seemingly noble, this whole range of outward externalized worldly activity appears real. It feels all too important to us until it isn't, until we start to notice that what appeared real might not actually be real because no matter how much pleasure I acquire, I'm never fulfilled. No matter how much wealth I acquire, I'm never permanently satisfied, never permanently made to feel safe. I don't ever feel like I have enough. And my kids are always causing me problems. No matter how much I love them, I'm never satisfied with them. My relationships, although they were nice in the beginning, have now, I guess, soured or there are problems, et, et cetera, et cetera. Like sooner or later, we all come to the conclusion that this world that seems so real, that the promises of this world that seems so fulfilling don't measure up to this deep seated desire in us for lasting fulfillment. Then we start to wonder about all this spirituality stuff. Well, maybe what the Buddha was saying was true. Maybe what all these Vedanta texts are talking about does exist. Maybe there is a God or some higher principle or some Tao or some, you know, the force or whatever. It doesn't matter. You don't even need to articulate it at this point. You just have to have this innate sense that what appeared to be real, the world, is in actuality insubstantial and not lastingly fulfilling. And what seemed so distant, far away, and conceptual is perhaps becoming more and more immediate, more and more important, at least more and more fascinating for you. How does Viveka come? Well, we would say just by living your life. There's no other way to get Viveka than by living your life and experiencing this world for what it is. You have to pursue wealth up to a point. You have to pursue pleasure. And if not in this incarnation, then maybe in the next. At some point, you're going to wake up to this. The world is not as real as you thought it was. And God is far more real than you previously presupposed. There must be something to it. And sometimes what it takes is to meet a, a holy man holy woman, an enlightened being. Because then you, for the first time in your life, meet a happy person who isn't naive or gullible. You meet someone who is genuinely through and through peaceful and unshakably fulfilled. And then you're like, this is actually, oh my God, this is possible. You know, in Sri Ramakrishna's Leela, it wasn't until people met Sri Ramakrishna that they felt like there was something to spirituality. Before they met Sri Ramakrishna, they were like, these are all just concepts. You know, Maya, Brahman, whatever. God, okay, whatever. It's just part of my... Um, I don't know about that. You can say, oh, it's just part of like my, my culture. Religion is something that I participate in culturally. I just go to church on Sundays. I just, I don't know, participate in Durga Puja. You know, if you grew up in East Bengal, like whatever, it's not, it's not real. It's just cultural. Then you meet Sri Ramakrishna and they, you know, said about Sri Ramakrishna that what felt real in the city seemed unreal in the presence of Sri Ramakrishna. The world with all of its sorrows and dangers 
paled in comparison to this living reality, the presence of the divine that Sri Ramakrishna embodied all throughout the day. And his house, I mean, his little room in the Dakshineshwar temple garden was a mart of joy, a mansion of mirth. There was singing and dancing and there was fulfillment there in a way that uh, was wholly different from the fleeting and, and shaky fulfillment of Calcutta, which was only a ferry ride away, you know? So in the presence of Sri Ramakrishna, Viveka came naturally. You just felt like spirituality was real and the world wasn't. So a great master like that can help us. Sri Ramakrishna, what to say of Sri Ramakrishna, who was an avatar, but really any Jivan Mukta, any liberated being, any slightly holy person, anybody who has totally absorbed themselves in spiritual life will have a certain fragrance to them. And when you come into contact with them, it will awaken Viveka in you. They'll be like, this stuff, oh my God, it's real. Okay, that's the prerequisite. In Tantra, we say, this is the grace of God. It's only through Shakti Pata that this Viveka arises. So remember how I said non-duality involves God and a lot of people hoping to kind of be an agnostic and atheist come to this, you know? Notice in the very opening phrase, I mean, verse in the uh, uh, Avaduta Gita, you get this line. Ishvara nugraha deva pumsam advaita vasana mahat bhaya paritranat vipranam upajayate this is the Mangala Charana, the invocatory verse to God and Guru that is traditionally, you know, an opening to one of these texts. And in this invocatory verse, notice what he's saying. Ishvara Anugraha Deva. In Eva, it is only through the Anugraha, the grace of God. Ishvara Anugraha Deva, uh, Pumsam Advaita Vasana, that someone develops the proclivity for non-duality. So if you are here at all, it's because of the grace of God. Somehow, um, you have felt drawn to spiritual life. There's a natural viveka that arose in you. That is only through grace. Ishvara Anugraha Deva. Uh, what's the result of this interest in Vedanta? Mahadbaya Paritrana. You'll be free from all fear eventually. So the verse is literally, through the grace of God alone, the desire for non-duality arises in the hearts of the wise, thereby saving them from great fear. And then in Aparokshana Bhuti, verse 3, Shankara says, by serving the Lord Hari, by serving God with devotion, one can come to develop the necessary requirements for Vedanta. So if you have sadhana chatushtaya, it's only because um, you earned the grace of God. So they would say you are all uh, punyatmas, like beings of high, 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 uh, punya, punya, high, high merit. If you have a lot of good merit, you'll enjoy a good life. If you have like a lot of good merit, you'll come to Vedanta. That's the general understanding. So it's through the grace of God that this Viveka comes. Okay, what's the result of this Viveka? So the first thing you need is Viveka. The second thing you need is Vairagya. Once you know, there's a, once you can discern between that which is really real versus that which seems real, naturally, there should come now renunciation or rather dispassion for that which you know is unreal. Despite it's seeming reality. I'm, I have to keep stressing this because even though you know the oasis is a mirage, it doesn't change that you'll still see a body of water in the distance, in the desert sun, right? Just because you know the world is unreal doesn't mean it's suddenly going to go away or doesn't mean it's suddenly going to stop tempting you or asserting its influence on you. Any more than, you know, a mirage won't suddenly disappear just because you know it's a mirage. So it still will seem real, but you know it's unreal. And as a result, you should have dispassion for it. You should no longer be interested in pursuing that which you know will never ultimately slake your thirst. That's Vairagya. That's the second one. Now, the third one is called the Shat Sampati. Surprise, surprise, accounting trick. These are six things. So we've smuggled into our list of four, six more things. So <laughs> brace yourselves. They are, first and foremost, Shama, Shamaha, Dhamma, Titiksha. I'm going to explain them in a bit. Titiksha, uh, Uparati, Radha, Samadana. Or I think Samadana comes first and then Shraddha. But I'm going to talk a little bit about how Shankara plays around with this in just a moment. So for now, this is the order in which we, we get this. Okay, Shama, Dhamma, Titiksha, Uparati, Shraddha, Samadana. These are, these are character traits, the sixfold treasures. Character traits that you need to have in order for a profitable study of Vedanta. The first one, Shama, means mental poise. It just means not thinking about the sensual objects of the world that you know are unreal and are ultimately unfulfilling. So this means not thinking about money. This means not thinking about the objects of the passions. This means not 
fantasizing about ambition, how many followers you're going to have, how much money you're going to have, all that. Just internally deciding to stop thinking about it. And this is very important because even though you know the world is unreal, as Krishna teaches Arjuna in chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita, by merely thinking about the world, one will eventually develop an attachment to those very sense objects. And naturally from that arises desire. And from that naturally arises great frustration and anger whenever those desires are obstructed in the course of their fulfillment. You'll recall that verse, a very important verse. Um, dhyayato vishayan pumsa sangate shupajayate. Oh, Arjuna, by thinking, dhyayato, by thinking of the sense objects, vishaya, sangha, uh, uh, attachment, sangha, attachment, upajayate, arises. Sangat sanjayate kamaha, kamat krodho bhijayate. And this desire is the seed of anger. So from desire comes, as we know from Krishna, that thinking about the objects of desire will interrupt our vairagya. So we need to have this mental discipline, this mental poise to not like think about those things, to just replace those thoughts with positive spiritual currents. That's shama. Shamaha is an internal thing that you do with your mind inside. Dhamma is what you do with your actual literal organs of perception. So dhamma means literally not looking. You know, so if there's some kind of stimulus, like some ad or something, you don't look at it because you know that the ad is designed to create desire in you. You know that if you look at objects of desire, you will think about objects of desire. You'll never escape their tyranny. You will forever be in the thraldom of the senses if you continue to engage the senses and look at all these like things in the world, right? So up to a point, up to a point, there must be some dhamma, some checking of the outward going tendency. So meaning don't look, don't go. Don't go to environments that stimulate these desires. Don't reach out even though you want to reach out, et cetera, et cetera. It's a discipline. Like how horses in a chariot, you need to have some strength to rein them in. Otherwise, they'll run amok and the chariot will fall over. So it means skillfully riding the chariot of your body and senses. That's Dhamma. These two things obviously are very difficult. I mean, it's, it's a tall order. So you'll need to have Titiksha. Titiksha means forbearance. It means a kind of endurance, a kind of mental toughness that endures hardship, endures challenge, is willing to suffer growing pains in the name of progress, and um, is able to recover after many failures. There's going to be so many failures on the path of the Sadhana Chaturshtaya. You're going to try to restrain the eyes. They're going to go. You're going to try to not think about stuff. You're going to think about stuff. And so you'll need to have the mental courage and fortitude to not give up after a few failures. So what? The mind gives you a few blows. The world gives you a few, few blows. You've been knocked off your Advaita horse once or twice. Who cares? As many times you get knocked off the horse, that many times and more you get back on. That's Titiksha. Not only that, Titiksha includes um, enduring hardship for the sake of receiving teaching. So you might have to walk a great distance. In the olden days, you might have to go deep into the forest in order to meet a guru who might Mr. Miyagi you for years. I think about uh, Milarepa and Marpa. Marpa was the Buddhist Tibetan Buddhist master of Milarepa, who like basically made him build a fort over and over and over and over to purify him of past karmas and never gave him any instruction. Milarepa had such titiksha, such forbearance that he was willing to patiently endure all of that like hazing in order to get his lesson, you know? Uh, so it might mean like driving to a place far away to go to a retreat. It might mean, you know, making sacrifices in your schedule to come to these lectures. It also might mean struggling through some Sanskrit, struggling to, through some terms that are not familiar to you, um, struggling to memorize certain verses. Because as I said last week, it's very important that you memorize these verses. If you want to be able to use your tools, you've got to have them with you. <laughs> so if you don't memorize these verses, they're not going to be there for you when you need them. You know, so that's the tiksha, to take the time to memorize these texts, commit them to memory, to make them a part of who you are. You'll need that. Fourth, you'll need uparati, meaning you'll need to constantly apply yourself to this stuff. You can't just do it once or twice and expect them to uh, these teachings to have a lasting hold or a lasting influence in your life. You'll have to do it over and over and over again. Uparati means literally staying with it, just constantly doing it, not wasting away or dissipating energy in other things, but staying with this thing. That's uparati. Next, you'll have to have shraddha, faith, a kind of working faith, not just in the teaching and in the teacher, but also in yourself. You need to kind of, I mean, not like believe blindly. I mean, it's not faith in the sense of like, yes, you're great. So I believe you. But in some sense, it is that it's like you are happy. And I have faith that I too can be happy. And I have faith that the scriptures 
are the source of your happiness. That you, the guru, learned from the scripture. And I, the student now, I'm going to say, um, I believe you. I believe you that these scriptures are true. I believe that you've mastered them in your life. And I believe that other people have. And not only that, I believe that I can too. That's Shraddha. If these great masters realized it, why not me? I can do it too. If I stick with it, if I have forbearance, if I restrain my organs of, 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 of perception, if I control my mind, why shouldn't I too have the fruit of this study like the masters who have come before me? You know, there's a beautiful mantra that we do in Puja. Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam Sadapasanti Suryaha Viviva Chakshuratatam. Chakshu means eye. So it, it's a mantra that says, oh, may I see with the eyes of the sages who have come before me. Why should I too not aspire to Rishihood? Right? That's Shraddha. Finally, Samadhana, which means focus. You just have to be able to discipline the mind so that it can stay with the teaching. Look, if you come to these or if you study these texts and you're not fully present with the text, it's not going to work. You have to really kind of sit upright and be with it. And in a traditional teaching setting, there are a lot of invocatory verses, incense is lit. Um, you sit in a room, maybe outdoors in nature or in an ashrama. There's a picture of your guru's guru. There's a picture of like the ishta, maybe Shiva or something, whatever the ashram values. And then you're sitting there in this sacred space and you learn with as much focus and intention as possible. A good way to kind of create this samadhana, this reverence, is to remember who's teaching. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna himself is teaching. And that will give you, and in the tantras, Vijnana Bhairava, Shiva himself is teaching. So if you remember, this is literally God revealing unto us the, these things, then we can like, you know, if it's just like some phone salesman, you're like, yeah, whatever. But then if God shows up and God's like, I'm about to give you the keys to your freedom, to your own godhood, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I'm focused. <laughs> so like that, you'll need to have focus. Now notice that Samadana is just like Raja Yoga. It's just a meditative ability, ability to concentrate. And Shraddha is just like Bhakti Yoga, the ability to have reverence for the teacher, for the text, for the truth, and to have faith, you know? Okay. Now the final thing, the fourth qualification. So just to uh, refresh, the first one was Viveka, discernment between what is really real and what seems to be real but isn't. The next one is Vairagya, therefore a dispassion and a disinterest in that which is unreal. Um, <laughs> oh, Emerson, I know, right? They say Maya, in order to keep the game up, really doesn't like when people study Advaita Vedanta because it's the most direct way out of Maya. So she tries her best as just part of this hide and seek to keep you from it. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so first one, Viveka. Next one, Vairagya. Third one, Shat Sampati, which is the, the series of six things that we just discussed. Uh, Shamaha, Dhamma, Uparati, Titiksha, Shraddha, Samadana. Um, all that. And then finally, you need mumuk shutvam, the intense desire to get free. You need to really deep down inside want it. You have to want to be free. If you don't want to be free, to the degree to which you enjoy your prison, to that degree, no one will convince you to leave. You know, so if you're still like interested in the world, by all means, you know, enjoy yourself to your heart's content. But if you start to sense the limitation of the world in lastingly fulfilling you, then naturally there will arise this burning desire for liberation. It's like a desire, unlike any other desire, because it's focused, it's focused inward, and it's more nourishing and fortifying than those other desires that are very dissipated. So mamukshutvam is a type of desire, a specialized form of desire. It's a longing. I like the word longing. You know, it's a longing for a place that you once knew as your home. And as Jenna was describing beautifully on Monday, it's that vague memory. I think in, in the German language, there's that word fernway. Have you heard it? Fernway. It means a kind of like nostalgia. Google, it's a beautiful word. Uh, I put it in the chat, Fernway. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's like nostalgia for a place that you never visited or hankering after an emotion that you never really have had yet in your life. Beautiful word, right? And that might be mumukshutvam. And that, you know, increases over time as you continue. Okay. So now I'd like to reveal what I think is uh, a very important part about this schema. And it's from the Himalayan monks. This is kind of their hack, their understanding. If you want any one of these qualities, you can get them by cultivating the one that comes after. Okay, so let me say that again. If you want Viveka, you should cultivate Vairagya. If you want Vairagya, you should cultivate the Shat Sampati. If you want Shat Sampati, you should cultivate Mumuksha. And I guess you can't really cult cultivate Mumuksha. You can't like tell a person, just be hungry, right? You can't really do that. So to cultivate Mumuksha, you live in the world. 
So by living in the world, you naturally get mamukshutvam. According to Sri Ramakrishna, mamukshutvam is all you need. The Kabir says beautifully, in the quest for the beloved, it's the intensity of your longing that does all the work. Look at Kabir and you will see a slave to that intensity. So yeah, you can argue that these great ecstatic lovers of God say, you don't need anything but longing. You know, but if you say, okay, longing aside, if you want shraddha, if you want faith, you must have samadhana. To the degree to which you can focus your mind, to that degree, your mind will be purified. And to that degree, you'll have shraddha. The more shraddha you have, the more faith you have in the text, in the teacher, in this study, the more uparati you're going to have. The more you're going to stay with it, the more you're going to do it. The more uparati you have, the more titiksha you're going to have, mental toughness, fortitude, because you're willing to stand your ground for that which you love and that which you engage in often. And as a result of your titiksha, of your forbearance, of your constant engagement with the practice, of your faith, you're going to get dhamma, the control of the external sense organs. And as a result of the external control, you're going to have shamaha, internal control. As a result of internal control, you're going to have true and lasting vairagya. And as a result of vairagya, you're going to have viveka. <laughs> you see, that's the hack. These are all doing words. These are all things that you can do and you can cultivate. You can cultivate bhumukshutvam, ironically, through worldliness. Eventually, everyone will get dissatisfied. And bhumukshutvam will give you the impetus to meditate, which will give you faith. You can cultivate faith by constantly coming into contact with masters, by constantly visiting the text. Uparati is that act of constantly doing it. You know, titiksha, you can cultivate it as you continue along the path. You'll be dealt a few blows and naturally that will toughen you up and you'll learn dhamma, you'll learn shamaha and ultimately you'll all be master renunciants, at least internally. And only then will you have viveka, the discernment between that which is unreal and that which is real and the commitment to live for that which is real. You see? Fun, right? This is kind of like, you must be this tall to ride this ride. If it's not working, if down the road you find that all this Advaita knowledge is not being assimilated, not being actualized, look to this. These are the foundations. This fourfold qualification is the prerequisite for a profitable study of Vedanta. My warning is that if you do not actively start cultivating these now and tuning them and upping them as you go along, then your Vedanta study will not be on firm foundation and will just be book learning. So any teacher of Vedanta must do his, her, their duty by first and foremost introducing you to this Sadhana Chatushnaya. And uh, notice that in Aparokshana Bhuti, Shankara starts with this. He starts with a beautiful invocatory verse, which is um, uh, Shri Harim Paramanandam Upadeshtaram Ishwaram. Salutations to the Lord Hari, who is literally bliss itself. Shri Hari Paramanandam, who is himself supreme bliss. Upadesha means teaching. Upadesha, uh, Upadesh Taram Ishvaram. Who's teaching this is? Who is now teaching me, right? So salutations to the Lord Hari, who is literally bliss itself, the ultimate teacher. Vyapakam Sarva Lokanam, who pervades, who pervades this whole world. Vyapakam Sarva Lokanam Karanam Tam Namamyaham, who is the cause of everything, who is the spiritual cause of the appearance of the world, who pervades the entire world. To that God I bow. Tam namamyaham. Namama, not me. Aham, I bow, not me. Naham, na namaste, you know, to bow, to say not me. Thou, my Lord, thou, my Lord, not me. So interestingly, Shankara, this great non-dual master, starts with this beautiful, verse one is this, you know, Shri Harim Paramanandam Upadeshtaram Ishwaram Vyapakam Sarvalokanam Karanam Tam Namamyaham I bow to that spiritual cause of all the worlds who is himself pure bliss pervading everything, who is the teacher of the highest non-duality. To that one I bow. That's his invocatory verse to God and the Guru. And then the next verse is, beautifully, I forgot it, so I'm just going to read it. Um, Apa, uh, okay, the next verse describes Aparokshana Bhuti. I'm not going to get into it because it's a very loaded verse and it will sidetrack me. So I'm going to skip verse 2. I'm going to go straight to verse 3. Um, here, verse 3 is so nice. Sva varnashrama dharmena tapasahari toshanat sadhanam prabhavet pumsam vairagyadi chatushtayam By constant performance of one's own duty, according to one's varna and ashrama, meaning according to one's, I guess you could say, caste, one's job in this world, and one's age. So if you're a student, study. If you're a householder, be a good householder. If you're a vanaprashta, uh, a retiree, then do that right. Like, that's varna. I mean, sorry, that's ashrama. 
Varuna means like uh, Brahmin, all that. So whatever Varuna you are, notice how anti-caste this is. Not anti-caste, but it's like inclusive. It says whatever caste you might be, if you just do that well, and whatever age you might be, if you're just doing that well, plus by the performance of austerity, which is spiritual practice, plus by devotion to the Lord, a person can gain the necessary four qualifications, such as dispassion and so on. Okay? So, if one just lives life well and dutifully, and is just a normal citizen, a good Samaritan, and if one has genuine devotion to the Lord, the grace of the Lord will come, the Shaktipat will come, and you will have the fourfold qualifications. That's verse three of Aparochana Bhutti. You must have the fourfold qualifications. Now, I want to point at something so special here. What does he say? He says, um, Vairagya di Chatushtayam. He starts with Vairagya. Vairagya is to Shankara the central requirement. He starts with Vairagya. He says, like Vairagya, and so on, you know? And so verse 4 is about Vairagya. And, and this might scare you. It's a rather um, hardcore and austere verse. It goes like this. Um, Brahma dishta faranteshu vairagyam vishayeshvanu yataiva kaka vishtayam uh, vairagyam tadhi nirmalam kaka means crow, okay? So he's saying here, the pure and perfect dispassion, vairagya, is such a sense of indifference. No? Uh, Chinmayanda Swamiji is translating it as a version, but I don't like that because a version, I mean, Swamiji is great and all, I mean, not to you know, contradict, but a version, it's, it, it implies like also the opposite, attachment. So a version is a kind of attachment, I would argue. Hate is a form of love, right? So I wouldn't use aversion, I would use indifference. I think the word here is more indifference. The pure and perfect vairagya is such a sense of indifference to all the sense objects, vishaya, the word here is vishaya, um, from the position of Brahma, the creator, to an immobile object like a blade of grass, as one would have towards the droppings of a crow. I mean, I don't hate a crow's droppings. I don't see like crow shit and I'm like, I hate that. That doesn't, that is an affront to me that can't be there. No, it's no big deal. Nor am I going to go and lick it, right? I'm indifferent to it. It's, it's, there's nothing to do with me. It's a crow's leavings. Kaka, crow. I should have that level of indifference to the entire range of Vishaya, sensible objects, from Brahma, the creator deity, down to a blade of grass. That's why in one story, the Buddha says, he meets Brahma, right? Brahma, the creator deity, appears before Buddha, and Buddha says, I've gone even beyond you. Not to say this is irreverence, it's just indifference. It's not like I'm hankering after that. So that's, according to him, this is what Vairagya is, to have this indifference to the world as if it was nothing more than um, crow's droppings. You know? Then he explains Viveka. So in verse 4, he first explains Vairagya. Then in verse 5, he says, um, Nityam Atma Swarupam Hi Drishyam Tadvi Paritagam Evam Yo Nishchayaha Samyag Viveko Vastu Nahasavai. Atman in itself is alone permanent. The seen is opposed to it. Such a settled conviction is known truly as discrimination. The discernment between the seer and the seen, like all that, which we talked about last week. Okay, and then he goes on to talk about. Um, Uparati, you know, he talks about Shama, Dhamma, then he talks, then he talks about Uparati, then he talks about Titiksha, then he talks about Shraddha, then he talks about Samadana. So notice that. And then finally he talks about Mumukshutvam. So I'm going to present now Shankara's order. Knowing what we know now about the Himalayan monk's strategy of getting the prior with the latter, this is Shankara's order. Okay, he starts with Vairagya. How do you get Vairagya? Through Viveka. That's what he's suggesting. You, you, Vairagya is the highest thing. You need it. To get it, you do Viveka. How do you get Viveka? Through Shama and Dhamma. Then how do you get these? Through Uparati. How do you get Uparati? Through mental toughness. Titiksha. Uparati means constantly engaging with this, this task. Then Titiksha. How do you get Titiksha? Through Shraddha. How do you get Shraddha? Through Samadana. How do you get Shamadana? Through Mumukshutvam. This is the order in which he presents it. And I thought I would present it to you in the way that it's listed in Aparokshana Bhuti. Okay, good. I think we kind of covered a lot today, huh? That is enough, I think. 
I'll just close by sketching out these nine arguments, which we'll explore in depth tomorrow. By the way, I gave you a sampler last week, right? Last week, we explored three arguments. We explored drashta, drishya, the difference between seer and seen, which, by the way, Shankara is saying is what Viveka is. He's saying Viveka, by definition, is this ability to discern between me, the seer, and the mind-body world which I'm seeing, the scene, right? So interestingly enough, uh, that's according to him, Viveka. So uh, we explored that, Drashta Drishya, we explored Chid Jara, we explored Savikara, Nirvikara, and we gave you a bit of a taste of those arguments, just to kind of keep everyone interested. Um, now I'll present nine, and I'll just sketch them out. I'm not going to explain them. I'm just going to sketch them out and give you a test, and next week we'll actually look at them. So here are the nine arguments. Now, one, just one thing to say first, is that these aren't mathematical proofs. They're not logical proofs. They're not appealing to the intellect. They're persuasive styled arguments. They're arguments just meant to persuade you to see life in a different way. That's it. Okay, so don't look for like philosophical rigor. It's not, not about that. It's more about persuasion, a lawyer's argument, if you will, as uh, Swami Sarvapanji often says, the lawyer's argument. Okay, starting, uh, first one. Body is a composite, yet the self is one. Notice, the body is made of parts, right? Do you feel like you yourself are made of parts? You feel like one person, one homogenous self. But the body is clearly made of parts. So then, how can you, the homogenous, partless one, be the same as a heterogeneous, composite body? Simple as that. <laughs> So childlike in its simplicity. You have no parts, the body has parts. Therefore, you can't be the body. Argument number two. The body um, has no life of its own. You feel yourself to be alive. So when you are in the body, the body is alive and all the functions come on. But when you're not in the body, the body is dead and inert. So you are alive, the source of life, and the body is the enlivened. You are the enlivener, the body is the enlivened. How can the enlivener and the enlivened be the same thing? Obviously, they're different. <laughs> Second argument. Third thing is, uh, this is so cute. The body is inauspicious, whereas the self is auspicious. Basically, you feel yourself to be pure. You feel yourself to be clean. Your natural sense right now, I mean, not psychologically, but innately, deep down inside, you feel yourself to be auspicious, good. Life is good, self is good, yet the body is inauspicious. It's full of a, in the belly of the body is a pitcher of feces. It's got organs that secrete unmentionable substances. Look under the skin and you will see a horrifying picture of like a skull grinning stupidly and nerves and muscles and sinews and tissues. The body is straight up gross. This is not reasoning that would be very popular in our current body affirming culture, but it was probably quite popular back then, especially to combat lust. You know, lust is only skin deep. If you really saw what it is you were lusting for, you'd run the other way. <laughs> You're like, I want that body. Really? Do you know what it is? <laughs> Peel back the skin just a little bit. You'd be like, ugh, a picture of feces in the belly, right? Like Tripura Rahasya uses that language. So the body is inauspicious. It's full of inauspicious secretions. Yet the self, it feels clean. It feels pure. It feels good. It feels auspicious. That's the third argument. The fourth argument is the self is conscious. The body is inert. Chid Jara, we explored this last week. You are aware of the body. The body is not aware of you. Last week, I told you about Greg Good's experiment. The American author, Greg Good, he's a Vedantist. He says, look at your hand. Nobody will claim that the hand is looking at them. They are looking at the hand. The hand is not looking at you. So obviously the hand is an object. You are conscious of the hand. So how can the conscious and the unconscious be the same? How can sentience and the inert be one and the same? The body is inert. I am sentient. They both can't be true at the same time. The fourth argument is Savikara Nirvikara. Like we said last week, you feel yourself to be the same person. Even when you were a child, now you're a young adult, maybe an older adult, eventually you'll be like an old woman, old man, old person. But all throughout those changes in the body, you feel yourself to be the same person. How can that be? How can you be both unchanged and yet be the body which is full of change? Right? And final one. This is kind of like Chit Jara, but there's a slight nuance. You are the seer. The body is the scene. How can the subject and the object be the same? Can the I be the pot in the sentence, I see a pot? Not any more than a knife can cut itself, than a mirror can reflect itself, than a screwdriver can screw itself, haha, <laughs> than eyeballs can look at themselves. This violates the principle of self-reflexivity. 
You can't use a thing on itself. A finger cannot point to itself. Similarly, the seer cannot become the scene. That would violate this principle of self-reflexivity. So, you cannot be the scene. You are the seer in the sentence, I see a pot. So anytime you're seeing something, there's a distinction between you and that which you're seeing. If that weren't true, why can't you see your own eyeballs? Right? If you could turn a seer into a scene, you should be able to see your own eyeballs. And you might say, but the reflection. No, no, it's, it's a reflection. You're seeing a reflection, not your eyeballs in real time. Okay, then the, at the end of all of these, by the way, I should tell you, every time he gets to the end of one of these, he says something like, um, Kim Agyana Mataha uh, Param. Kim Agyana Mataha Param. What greater delusion can there be? What greater ignorance is there? You are unchanging, the body is changing. You think you're the body, what greater ignorance is there? You are a seer, the body is the scene. You think they are the same, what greater ignorance is there? The body is inauspicious, you are auspicious. How can the auspicious be the same as the inauspicious? There is no greater error than that. The body is the enliv enlivened, you are the enlivener. How can the enlivener and the enlivened be the same? No greater ignorance than that. The body is made of parts, you are indivisible. How can the partless be the composite? There is no greater ignorance than that. You know, so over and over, he's just showing these contradictions. Now, a few extra ones. Avista Traya Viveka. So this is the seventh. Avista Traya Viveka is, you're only a body in the waking world. When you go to sleep tonight, you'll be wholly unconscious of this body. You'll enter into a dream body. And if you're in deep sleep, you'll be wholly unconscious of that deep sleep body. So how then can you be the body when you're only that one third of the time? Can you be both a donkey and an ass? I mean, sorry, an ass and a horse? You can't be both this body and the dream body. And you might say, but I was it at different times. Well, then, Savikara Nirvikara. You feel yourself to be the same, even though you've been experiencing all three. Okay, and then final, final two. Good, Jenna. Final two. Um, where do you end and where does the world begin? I'm speaking in terms of physicality. Where does the body stop and where does the not body begin? Isn't, a, a scientist will tell you, isn't this world just one continuous field of matter? How can you separate this bit of matter from that bit of matter? What's the difference between your body and literally the rest of the sea of matter? Where do you end and where does the body begin? Or rather, where, and, and this is a play on Swami Brahmananda's uh, statement, which is, where does, show me the line of demarcation between matter and spirit. Where does spirit end and where does matter begin? Which is a very sophisticated version of this. This is a simple version, which is, where does the body start? Where does the world end? Where does the body end? Where does the world start? You can't. You can't single out your body in this indivisible mass of matter. Thirdly, uh, um, finally, ninthly, ninth argument is, you know, if you lose an arm, do you really feel, honestly, like your selfhood is diminished? You might be upset because there are things that you can't do, but you don't actually feel like less of a person. In fact, I would argue sometimes people's egos are grandized when they suffer a loss of a limb. Now they have this whole victim narrative about it. But I mean, intuitively speaking, it's not like you feel like you've lost a part of you when you lose a part of your body. You could say, I've lost a part of my body, I've lost a part of my life, but you're still the same you that's saying that. Intuitively, innately. Okay. I'm just sketching these arguments. These are nine arguments to prove that you are not a body. To close this lecture, what's the test then? If you really understood this lecture, and if you really understood last week's lecture, I mean last week we went, we went hard, right? And at the end of the lecture, we have to be able to say with conviction, as much conviction as I can say I am not this, with that much conviction and more, I have to be able to say I am not this. So how do you test that? Very simple. Is there lust? <laughs> it's as simple as that. If you lust after another body, it's not that other body's fault, okay? It's not their fault for tempting you. It's never anybody's fault that you're attracted to them. No, it's only because you think you're a body. If I think I'm a body, you know, I'm going to identify with the sex of this body. So let's say even in the case of homosexuality, if I'm a man attracted to man, it's only because I think I'm a man that I'm attracted to another man. If I'm attracted to women in heterosexuality, it's only because I think I'm a man that I feel the polarity. There's a woman attracted. Wait, to the degree to which I am attracted by a female body, given that I am heterosexual, to the degree to which I am attracted to a female body, to that degree I haven't understood this argument. Because I still think I'm the body. But when I start to realize that I am spirit, ever pure, ever free, and not the body, then I start to see other people as that too. And my vision becomes the vision of a nine-year-old, ideally. And I start to see other people, not as a woman, you know, but as a soul, as a spirit. And how then is that soul different from me? So if I know I'm not a body, I also know you aren't either. If I'm attracted to you physically, it must be because I think I'm a body. So that's why I say you can never accept this teaching from a teacher who exhibits lust. You can't because they themselves don't understand it. How could they? 
How could they tell you you're not the body and then they themselves act like a body? <laughs> it's folly, is it? Isn't it not? Okay, so that's it. That's all we wanted to say today. A slightly heavier, longer lecture. It's the centerpiece of all that we're going to do. Next week, um, we're going to actually start the Ashtavakra verse by verse and um, armed with your sadhana chatushtaya, armed with these prerequisites, we're going to take up a profitable study of Vedanta. And I pray to the Lord that all of us will get to the point where we can truly imbibe and manifest, realize, integrate, and live out these highest of human ideals. Lord, my soul resonates, my soul delights with these teachings. It is thrilled to hear of the nature of Atman and Brahman. It knows itself to be that. I pray to the Lord that I may swiftly recognize and reclaim that essence nature and that I may make that essence nature manifest in each and every moment of my life. May it be so. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu Om Peace, Peace, Peace May this be an offering to the lineage. 